I stand before you today to address this distinguished gathering at the public lecture titled Policy Somersault, the Bill of Development in the Drug Public Service. To be delivered by the eminent Professor Ayo Omotaro, Director General of the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies. Firstly, let me express my gratitude to Professor Omotaro for gracing us with his presence and sharing his invaluable insight on the topic of utmost relevance to our national development. Let me quickly also add that the Corsi Court to the Vice Chancellor this morning. Uh, Professor Motayo has accepted to involve some of our professors in their brain, their brains coming to brain at NIPS in Kuru. So he has also given us the opportunity that uh, every month scholarship will be given to, and uh, sponsorship will be given to any of our nominated staff for their programs in JOS. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and lastly, on one condition, that we have a corner for NIMS in the library where their books will be donated to the university. <laughs> the importance of robust and consistent policies cannot be overstated, especially in the context of Nigerian's public service which plays a pivotal role in shaping the trajectory of our nation. As we delve into the discourse on policy somersault, we acknowledge that the stability and coherence of public policies are essential for sustainable development. In Nigeria, like in many nations, the public service act as the engine driving the implementation of policies and programs. Any consistency or abrupt shift in policy direction can have a profound effect on our developmental efforts. Professor Motaya, with his extensive knowledge and experience, is well equipped to shed light on the challenges posed by policy somersault and, more importantly, propose constructive solutions. His so role as the Director General of the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies reflects his commitment to advancing sound policy practices for the benefit of our nation. As we listen attentively to Professor Motayo's lecture, let us reflect on the implication of policy somersault on our social economic landscape. It is my hope that his insight will not only highlight the challenges but also inspire a collective commitment to fostering a policy environment conducive to sustainable development. I encourage all participants to engage actively in the discussion that will follow the lecture. The exchange of ideas and perspectives is fundamental to our growth as a society, and it is through such intellectual discourse that we can contribute to shaping the future of Nigeria's public service. Once again, I extend my appreciation to Professor Ayo Ontario for his willingness to share his expertise, and I look forward to a thought provoking lighting session. Thank you and with this public pleasure contributes significantly to our understanding of the complexities surrounding policy development in Nigeria. God bless. The Vice Chancellor, sir, with your kind permission, I would like to introduce a distinguished public lecturer, Professor Ayo Omotayo to stand and remain standing while I introduce you to the audience. Sometimes ago, precisely on Tuesday, 13 December 2016, in a deep public conversation at an august audience, Professor Omotayo in many cycles asked rhetorically, are we living in a dying earth? And in quick response with a short prologue, he said, when finally you wake up on a certain day and the earth refuses to shine her sun and you wait for the night to fall so that you can savour the beauty of the moon in its glory, 
or when you require water to find so much of it and none to use, or when you till the soil and it bleeds blood in return, or when you try to buy your usual food and the mama tells you fish is expensive and you ask, is it not that you just catch them in the seas and oceans for free and sell them perhaps with trucks? We can no longer catch fish in the ocean anymore. Then you panic and wonder if the second coming of the Christ is at hand. It is then you look up and then hear a voice saying, Son of Adam, Son of Adam, Son of Adam, why thou persecute me? Drawing analogy from the above epilogue. There seems to be a sense in today's discourse. Police somersault, being of development in Nigeria's public service. The Vice Chancellor said, It is not a coincidence or accident that Professor Omotayo was recognized to deliver this lecture, especially in the circumstance of the precariousness of the Nigerian states. It is a conscious choice by virtue of his height. Standing very tall. <laughs> Experience and propensity to peep into the future and pontificate. The Vice Chancellor, sir. Permit me, therefore, to introduce this tallest man within our menu. An accomplished son of late Pa Oriola Omotayo and late Mama Dokas Olabisi Omotayo. Both of Lagos descent. An alumnus of the Plymouth University of Nigeria, back to back, 1980 to 1990. A professor of environmental sustainability. A former dean of Faculty of Social Sciences, Lagos State University. A former director, Center for Planning of Lagos State University. A former president of Ibadan Jesus. Former Lasso Masters in Business. Administration program, he founded it. Developer of higher education management system and online payment and registration technology for last year. He developed cash transfer technology for international money transfer over the internet. He pioneered the engineering of IT system of the former Standard Trust Bank in Nigeria, first to offer <laughs> online. Real banking services in 72 branches in Nigeria. Professor Omotayo successfully guided the transfer of several emerging technologies into Nigeria through collaborations with international corporations such as Infosys of India and Real Secure of Redmond in the United States of America. Professor Omotayo is a foreign national scholar to the Austin Penn State University in Clarksville, Tennessee, and Murray State University at the state of Kentucky, United States of America. <laughs> Aside from academic endeavor and environmental advocacy, Professor Omotayo is a serial international entrepreneur. He is the founder of Netlink Incorporated, a computer consulting firm in Atlanta, Georgia, in United States of America. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor Sam, the man standing by your side is a thoroughbred manager of men and materials, a professor of professors, whose standard calling in academia has produced PhDs and professors in and outside of the shores of Nigeria. He is a manager of fellows and members of national institutes. A compatible gentleman who served 2015 annual Tuesday Ocean in public lecture on the youth and national development at the University of Ibadan still resonates. A geographer of the famous Alexander von Humboldt Stress, whose works laid the foundation for the science of biography in the world. He is a city planner, and if 
infrastructure development an author of dozens of books, including book in statistics, a fluvial geomorphologist and hydrologist, editor of Nigeria Geological Journal, third vice president of Association of Nigerian Geographers, member of Council of Association of Nigerian Geographers, fellow Association of Nigerian Geographers, a successful rice farmer. <laughs> Chris Chancellor, Professor Omotayo is an ASU activist extraordinaire. <laughs> he is a charity worker, a fundraiser, a lover of children, an excellent husband of his wife and the father of an only queen, Shefumi. The Vice Chancellor, sir, with your kind permission, I would like to invite Professor Matayo, Director General of National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies, to come to the lecture for a section. Thank you, sir. of your university. I appreciate the invite and I'm excited to be in your institution. Let me also say that I should have been in your university before now. Unfortunately, the first attempt to come over did not happen because there was a general ASU strike. Next, I was marked to be a lecturer at one of our events that was to be held at the Faculty of Social Sciences because the dean of that uh, faculty is of someone I will refer to as a brother. He actually invited me and despite uh, the humility of the invitation, I accepted because that gentleman has always done very well any time we have met. With your kind permission, Vice President, sir, can we, uh, can I respectfully ask that Professor Zimusa please stand up for recognition? Thank you. I was supposed to come and deliver a lecture in this faculty, but your Vice President is a very smart man. He has got Please, a round of applause for the Vice President. Let me say this investors can be made by one single person, and investors can be made by a multitude of persons acting. One thing I would say about the Vice President is that he is a very, very humble man. He knows how to seize opportunities, and I can tell you that wherever I have gone and wherever this matter has come up for mention, everybody tells me that there is no one that will want to do something for the vice chancellor because we see it again and again. I believe staff and students should please stand up if you don't mind and give him the recognition of deserve. and wear a toga of pride that after all I'm a professor and I'm a vice chancellor. And nobody's going to remove you from office, just do the normal things. But your vice chancellor 
has done much more than the normal vice president should have done. Now, for your vice president, he may, he may not know it, but I will say that his humility is a strategy. <laughs> and at some point at NIPS, what you do at NIPS is to study issues, study men, and study the environment. We will begin to look at how humility has now become a strategy for success. You can write that down. The last is, you know, I, I have noted that your humility is actually a strategy. And it's a good thing. Deputy Vice Chancellor, I recognize you. The librarian, the registrar, I recognize all of the professors that are here. And of course, I'm so excited to be speaking to a group of students that I believe are focused. Are we focused? Yes, sir. You don't seem to be ready. Are we focused? Yes, sir. Are we ready? Yes, sir. Do you do we think we can change Nigeria? You don't believe. <laughs> and to be candid, I, I acknowledge if the children act this innocence, the normal child will not lie. They don't believe they can change Nigeria because they don't believe that those of us who are elders have been able to change it. Is that, am I speaking your mind? That's why you feel that you cannot change Nigeria. But today, let me tell you that it takes one man to change everything. It takes the second man to add to the change. It takes the third man, believing that they can bring a change to ensure that change happens. Now, I listened to my own citation and I was wondering where did all this come from? And while I was standing, I was reflecting and I was even more surprised by the quote from my inaugural lecture of 2016. I, I, I knew since I, re I read that inaugural lecture, I have not had an opportunity of reading it all over again. And I will tell you that that particular quote that was brought out certainly is a signature to what is happening to everything that we confront today in Nigeria. I'm supposed to speak to the issue of policy somersault. But because I'm standing before an eminent group of students, I will say a few things, especially as it relates to my citation. Children, believe and dream your dreams. In 1997, when I was in America, I told a group of people, I said, in 10 years' time, Lecturers will sit in their offices and teach the million students at once. And people said that was a tall order that can never happen. I wrote codes, I wrote an application that would teach from, that I used to teach from my office in America. And I said, this is the future of the delivery of lecture. But not too many people believed it. And I let the code stay. In 2020, when COVID came, I remembered my quotes. And I was the first person in Lasso that started teaching my students from home based on a quote that was developed 23 years earlier. Children, when the time of your year comes, <laughs> do not despair because that idea will come. Things will change, they will never be the same thing. Now, children, listen, you can write this down. The next big thing is this, and I want you to write it down. You can be part of it. I've been saying this wherever I've had the opportunity. You will, in very few years, no longer need to buy drugs. Your drugs will be delivered on your phone. Not because you will order drugs to come to your phone, but because you will press to your phone and the pharmacopoeia that fills your body will enter your system. Write that down. We will deliver drugs to your phone. I will press your phone. If you have malaria, malaria tablet will enter your body without you swallowing. <laughs> 
and without you having to take an injection. You can write it down. It is going to happen. I can see it. I can see it, and that is the challenge. You can be a part of it. In 1999, when I told Western Union, I don't know many of you have received money from Western Union, I said, the technique you use today will no longer be relevant. I will develop codes. Today, we have FinTech. Everybody can get money transfers to his phone and you can spend your money. So I've told you the next thing that will happen, and I'm sure you will all be living witnesses to it. Now, to my lecture for today. See, at NIPS, we have what they call a sky manual. I can choose to complexify this lecture, and I can also choose to simplify it. If I choose to complexify it, I go the way of what PhDs do. Most of us here who have PhDs will tell, us, will tell you that uh, what we do when we write PhDs is to complexify a simple problem. There is one problem, you make it so difficult for yourself, and having built that problem, you are requested by your supervisor to solve the problem. It is like asking you to raise a mad dog, and at the end of the day, tame the monster you have built out of your dog. I can choose to do that. But because this audience is very, I will choose to simplify today's uh, lecture. So, let's go. That is the topic. What I want to assure you is this, and I'd like to just also bring this into this. We have found that for every human being, you do not have no human being actually, actually has the power or the strength to continuously be attentive for more than one hour. <coughs> so, we make our lectures 45 minutes, whatever you have to say, say everything in 45 minutes and let people engage you. And I was excited when the Deputy Vice Chancellor said that will be an opportunity for engagement because every opportunity we have like this is an opportunity to engage ourselves. After all, nobody is the wisest. We are all just working hard to contribute to our society. So I'm delivering this lecture today with a bent in my mind that we are looking for that better society. And that is what NIPS is set up for. Looking for that better society. And no one individual can buy himself or herself to find that better society. We have to find it collectively. So this lecture will not be more than 45 minutes hopefully. And I'm sure that we will learn from ourselves and I will engage with you at the end of the day. So we start. Now, there is a difference between the civil service and the public service. The generality of our people believe when they say public service is about civil service. No. The civil service has its own niche. And of course, the public service supersedes over everything. It includes the civil service, it includes the policy makers and the lawmakers, the judicial system, everybody that offers service to the public is in the realm of public service. So please do not go without a erroneous impression that the civil service equates the public service. They are just the microcosm of, of it. Now, there are different ways by which you can look at this. Let us look at um, some conceptual clarifications. We give conceptual clarifications because we know that everything has to be defined within the belief. Conceptual clarification. It's okay, because for public service, you know, I can be reading everything based on 99, the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria. We define that is what the definition of public services as the body of surrogates who bear the burden of the entire society for such purposes as order, growth, development, institutional development, and the rest of it. This is what public service stands for. Next slide, please. 
Now, when we talk of development, this is what development is. Just letting you know, because you can't be reading all of this. Next slide, please. Now, what is our theoretical premise? We are all, you might not be too fast in the issues of theory, theory of materialism, but on the screen here is what it stands for. You cannot afford to go too far into what it stands for, but these are issues that have to do with theory of materialism. Everybody looking for the collective good of the cause. Policies are supposed to look for the connected root of everybody, and of course, within the context of looking for that policy group, we have to situate it in the theory, and that is the theory under which the paper has been put together. Now, what is the policy? Generally, it's a set of ideas, a plan of what to do in particular situation that has been agreed. So officially, you know, by a group of people and this organization. You can read for yourself what a policy can stand for. Formal authorization of program of government, without a process, outcome, output, and it could also be a theory or models. Told people that policies are not suggestions. One of the problems we have in Nigeria is that when politicians give you their manifesto and you hold them to their manifesto, they get into office and begin to implement manifestos as if they are policies. Today, I stand before you to say that manifestos should not be seen as policies. Manifestos should actually be studied, subjected to various ideas, and of course beat it before you can turn manifestos into policies. Let us go to the next slide. So who formulates policies and who runs them? We are looking at who formulates policies now. You have the executive. Under the executive, the president will formulate policies. The ministers, the agencies of government, civil service, the MDs. The National Assembly, under the two chambers, the, the Senate and the House of Representatives, can also formulate policies. And of course, in Nigeria, we have various advisory bodies. We have, I also have the National Planning Commission. They all formulate policies at that very big level. And of course, if you come to the level of MDs, policies are also formulated within those agencies. In this university, policies are formulated by the management of the university. So, and of course, when you have your union government, like you call them, you also formulate policies. So policies are formulated by almost everybody that leads an organization or within an organization for the sole purpose of benefiting the vast majority of the people. Now, if you put that in context, it simply shows that we are all policy actors in our various ways. But it is often the case that we sit and criticize certain policies because they do not come within the realm of our influence. Policies are everywhere and it is not only government that formulates them. We are going to talk about policy for our song, but we are not there yet. But the essence of this is for us to know that there are different levels, there are different categories for form, uh, policy formulations, and we are all part of it. So when you sit and you want to criticize anyone, remember that at your own different level, you probably are also 
a policy actor. A policy actor is somebody who participates in the formulation of a policy and who is also <coughs> involved in running those policies. Next slide, please. A policy somersault. Now, before I tell us about policy somersault, I want to avail our minds to a particular issue. In our different homes, in our different places of work, how many times have we had to change the way we run our homes? Remember that as parents, sometimes you set rules. Probably you tell your children, you must come home by 7 p.m. That is your coffee. Ask yourself, how many times have you been able to keep ensuring that all of your children return home by 7 p.m.? We have always had need sometimes to change our ideas about matters, to change our approach to issues, and to modify a few things. So when people talk of quality of assault, they must remember that it is not by itself a bad thing. It, is, it becomes only a bad thing when a porous solution is being used are in, in place of a better solution. So somersaults by themselves are not bad. It is for whatever purpose that they are intended for that should dictate whether it should be a somersault or not. But let us look at how Unoli defines somersault. He says successive governments abandon inherited public policies and initiate their own which their successors equally abandon, thus leaving a trail of abandoned policies and projects resulting in near directionless uh, growth. The accusation here is that we set rules and we don't follow them. That everybody comes in with a different idea of what they want to do and that people do what they like. But as a student of policy, I stand before you to say that there are, day, there are times and seasons why things should change. And I stand before you to say that we are all social beings and social elements. We carry our own individual DNAs and we have different ideas of what we want to achieve. So some policy somersaults happen because as social beings we respond to our own stimulus and we try to do what we need to do. That we continue to be policy somersaults until when we realize how to turn our policies into laws. As long as policies do not become laws, they will continue to change because every individual believes he or she has his or our own right to put his or our own DNA in any institution over which he or she governs. And that is a socialistic behavior. It's psychological. Everybody wants to do his or our own thing because the tendency of a normal human being is to do what he or she likes to do. So there will come to be something uh, policy so by governments until we change policies into laws. When they become laws, they become harder to change because you cannot just change the law of the land anywhere. So when we talk about policy of assault, you must know why it happens. It starts from the individual. And that individual will not mean any harm beyond the fact that as, is, as an entity, as a person, he or she wants to ensure that his own personal DNA is imprinted on the sands of time until we change policies into laws. When we choose to believe that those policies are what we want to do, then there will always be policies from our sons. Regardless of what our, uh, uh, we have what we call policy inconsistencies too, which of course is attributed to lack of understanding of what we are doing. Let me tell you about this subsidy thing. For 50 years, 
Nigeria ran a regime of subsidy. Now, I, I tell you, the subsidy that was introduced at that time, when it was introduced, was to be an intervention. Now, we forget that an intervention is a short life policy that is supposed to have a lifespan. But over time, sometimes we forget that an intervention is different from the real deal itself. For 50 years, we did not have the courage to stop the intervention until we began to see the first subsidy as the right of every Nigerian. And of course, it became a monster that no government was willing or was able to touch. For several years, we were kicking the can down the line until the Tinubu regime came and said, we are going to stop for a subsidy. Now, that is a new policy of government. Of course, when policy changes, there will be what I call resistance. There will be pushbacks. And we saw that pushback with all the strikes that were uh, threatened, some were carried out by labor over the policy of the government. Now, when we put government under that kind of pressure, and the government wants to hold on to power, what it does will be to quickly change the policy again, and we complain that there has been a somersault. For uh, first subsidy, no matter what you think about it, whether it is well thought out or not, has become a policy. When we put government under pressure and it changes it, then we talk about policy somersault. We forget that the citizens have by themselves decided to go the other way while government believes in a particular uh, trajectory. Let's look at the next slide. So these are the types of somersault we have. Sudden reversals like we wanted during the first subsidy. Somebody has soon said that President Tinobu coming up and changing first uh, the subsidy regime was a sudden reversal. We have modifications. We have policy modifications. We have abandonment of established policies. Next. Now, why do we have policy somersaults? These are the reasons why we have policy somersaults. Political parties will come into power with a different ideology and they change things. Because we have to put this in perspective. Zones. We have religions or religions inter interfering with policies that we cannot fund. And sometimes we have corruption. These are the major reasons why policies change. I admonish us today to look at this and ask ourselves if all of these five factors keep interfering in policy set up, would that be changes or not? Every four years or so, there will be a different political party. I had laid the foundation before. Everybody wants to lay his own DNA. So when a different party comes into power, as it must happen every four years, policies are likely to change. So when you complain about the somersault, remember that when the party in power changes, the priorities will also change. And the only solution to that is if we have a collective policy, a, a, a policy that we have collectively agreed to and that has been turned into law. Let me give you an example of that. The, uh, the National Health Insurance Scheme is a policy that has survived since the Obasanjo days. It became what? A law. And I don't know any governor that has come to place to say he does not want any child again because you have to go back to the assembly to change it. So there will always be policy somersault because of these five factors. And as long as these five factors exist, and they always exist, every four years there will be a government in place. If we do not take into consideration the geographical location of where policies are put in place, there will always be a problem. Uh, about 18 months ago, no, about 12, 15 months.
few months ago, I was in, I was in Sokoto, and I found very, very elaborately built schools. Fantastic schools, science schools, built for girls. And those schools didn't have children. To be candid, the facilities the government put in place are even better than some you see in the universities. But of course, all over Nigeria, there is a law that says every child must go to school. Based on that, the governor built fantastic facilities. But if you look at that particular location, this facility will not work because the people there are different and I know the policies you are giving them does not work with their religion. I suggested to them, I said, there is nothing that says we cannot change the way we instruct our children. Some people you may not agree, do not trust the English language as a medium of instruction. And I tell myself, English is not the only language of instruction. There is Spanish, there is Portuguese, there is French, and there is Arabic. Why don't we teach children in the language that their parents trust? So if some people in Nigeria trust the Arabic language, why don't you teach them in Arabic language? So as long as our geographical locations are different and are differentiated, some policies may not work, and there will be need for that summer sort that to come. But I've already told us that we can modify certain policies to work for certain geographical locations. The same thing that goes for geography goes for religion. Certain religions do not accept certain practices. So we set up policies in a corner of Nigeria and we expect it to go to be accepted everywhere. It is not going to work. Not because the government people or government actors do not want policies to work. But because a country like Nigeria is multi-diverse, multi-religious, and we believe in different things. So how do you set up a policy that works for everybody? So that is part of our problem. And of course, there is also the funding problem. No matter how well the policy is well placed, no matter how well it is formulated, there are times when government is challenged by funding. You ask the question, why did you set up the policy if you knew you wouldn't be having the money to do or to run it? That is a problem we have in Nigeria. Most of the time we set up policies without looking at whether we can fund the policy. The NHIS is still there, it's working for it's working for those who it will work for. But of course, the majority of those who are targeted for the NHIS, the question remains, are they benefiting from it? How many of us here is benefiting from NHIS? How many of us are even aware of what NHIS is about? But of course, it is a policy of the land that people do not know about. And of course, we have the usual issue of corruption. And I always tell people that everybody is perhaps corrupt at its own level. Everybody will complain, Mr. President is corrupt. Let me tell you one thing. The, most, the, the person that it is most difficult for to be a corrupt person is Mr. President. If you know the number of rules that Mr. President must follow, the regulations are so severe that it is difficult for any person in Nigeria to steal Nigeria's money. Meanwhile, it is so easy for governors to do anyhow. So when you talk of corruption, it happens not only at the it happens more at the subnational level than at the national level. So do not sit here and believe that they are corrupt in Abuja. More and deep corruption goes more at the subnationals, at the state level. Two years ago, I sat with President Buhari, and he, he said to me, he said, do you know that governors are more powerful than me? If the president can say that, I wasn't the president, 
who have brought the president, he said so. There must be something they are saying. Because look at what governors do. They get away with anything they want to get away with that Mr. President cannot get away with. So when we talk of policy, some sort and the rest of it, you look at corruption and ask yourself where does corruption best sit? It does not sit with Mr. President mainly. It sits more at the subnational levels. And of course, as you go down, corruption penetrates the whole system. And if you are going to change everything, every individual must individually agree that is my action a corrupt action? It is easy to look at other people and complain that they are corrupt, but first let us check ourselves to see if we are by ourselves corrupt. And every of those things that, that come together make policies difficult to implement. Next slide, please. So, what are the effects of policy failures, some assaults, on the public service? I mentioned one word now. I said there are policy failures. There will be a somersault if there is a failure of policy. Now, not all policies fail because they are bad, but policies will fail mainly when the strategies for implementing them are not right. Let's look at the effects of... Next slide, okay. Now look at the seven effects of policy failure on the public service. Confused and we are not certain about what will happen next. We do not remember what we have done in the past. How many of us can remember all the health, all the educational policies that have been enacted in Nigeria? since 1960. But do you know that as a nation we do not have such large magnitude of policy failures? Look at the 6334 system that our students today are running. How many of these children can remember what we used to do years back? Do you remember, and I will tell our students here, that when we went to school, there was no 6334. Am I correct, sir? How many of you remember that there was a time when primary schools got to primary seven? And since we changed to 6334, educational system, it has been a consistent policy. It has been consistent to the extent that we have accepted it. But have we ever asked ourselves if that 6334 is working for us as a nation? Is it working for educational system? For me, I believe that it is either we fund the 6334 very well, because 6334 and we say this at the time it was set up, that there will be enough funding for the TVET section of the 6334. So I asked myself, that policy, is how we fund it so that our students, our children can have the benefit of 6334 or we revert to the old grammar school system that we can fund? But if that happens, people will say that there has been a policy somersault. But sometimes there is a need for policy somersault when certain structural defects are noticed in the structure that is existing. And when that happens, you have to shift, you have to modify, or you have to do a general overhaul, which we will call policy summation. I leave you with that thought. Is this 6334 working? The lack of funding. And we have to look at that. Of course, when the policy changes, morale will decrease. 
We will look back and say, oh, we have wasted the resources, the truth we set up in the first place. And of course, it makes us to doubt if there is need for long term planning. Now, I tell people, when you plan, you have to scale planning. It is one of the most difficult things to do to scope and to scale. Everybody thinks it's easy to formulate policies. Policies are difficult to formulate because it is often difficult to merge the scope it should have and the scale at which it should operate. So we ask ourselves, should there be long-term planning or short-term planning so that our policy can, set, can be set to be working? People begin to think that, oh, we don't know what they will do tomorrow. We don't know what they will do today. But we must always remember that policy summer sort in itself is not a problem by itself. It occurs as a result of so many factors that are inherent in our society and they bring a whole lot of uh, problems. And some of those problems are very uh, and then she said, well, next slide, please. So what can be done? Because at the end of the day, as a university system, you must ask, do I have a solution? Do we have a solution? Can we solve, can we solve the problem? So I have it there. What can be done? Government should need more impactful processes. Our communication should be clearer. If you are going to change any policy, and we should always remember the principles of utilitarianism during the formation of our processes. Next slide. with my final thoughts because uh, I'm supposed to still be by for the five minutes. I will end this way. Policy formulation is a science. If you miss the science, you miss the policy. Policies do not work when we do not have the right strategies in place. Number three, policies operate on humans. And human beings can change a whole lot. We must find policies that will work for different kinds, i use the word for different kinds of human beings. Number four, policies by themselves are a living set of documents. When something is living, it means it can grow and the growth can also decelerate. We must treat policies differently from we treat suggestions. Policies are the blood that runs the public service. And of course, if the blood has cancer in it, the body becomes sick. If our policies have issues, our nation becomes sick. And of course, our nation will be sick if we cannot find what is wrong with our policies. Our policies, like I've said, are affected by us, our religion, our places of our road, our past experiences, and of course, our corruptive tendencies. If we solve all of these problems, our policies can better work for us. Do not sit here believing that policies must not change. Policies will change when there has been a paradigm shift, when things have happened beyond the powers of the policy runners, policies will change. The important thing is for us to remember the principles of utilitarianism, which is policies must always be tweaked to work for better and bigger number of people even if it's going to change, let it work for the people than for a few. With that, I want to thank Mr. Vice Chancellor.
for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Horizontal 
communication, almost always. The gap, to me, is always about practical communication. That is, the end users, the end beneficiaries of policies are hardly consulted. Meanwhile, sir, you talked about the utilitarian value of policies. And so, if the people are the ones to benefit, shouldn't they always be consulted? So, who determines the utilitarian value of policies? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Rutsmiad, Director of Governance, and Governances. Okay, because when the DVC was released on 
dissertation about him, he also quoted the Bible. So I also want to make a quote. And it is this quote that I think we need to emphasize on because we talk about a solution. So this quote will give you the solution. And the quote is this. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. You see, human beings, human beings think we can do something. And that's why we have been some assault and some assault. And we can do that. So we continue to some assault. There is a new knowledge which has come out of Africa which is called the Everlasting Gospel, this new knowledge has the template to solve this problem. And this, knowledge, this new knowledge says, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us. When we have the Holy Spirit, corruption will stop, ethnicity will stop, we will see equality, we will see love for one another, and then you will see that policy will no longer serve us. So, Thank you. Um, on that note, I would revert to our distinguished lecturer. Okay, thank you very much. But well, we start with the last. Like I mentioned earlier, when I wrote my inaugural eight, nine years ago, I did remember that I have quoted God. But then that program it was out of the fact that a whole lot of things that science could not explain in the on the matter of environmental sustainability I left to God because there are certain things that science will still not be able to explain. But on this particular matter, I agree with you, sir, that was already, that um, every individual, like I mentioned, has a role to play. We have to look inwards to ourselves. Whether you are a Muslim, whether you are a Christian, or whether you are a traditionalist, none of the driving forces of those religions subscribes to anything negative, anything corrupt, all of those you expect that every individual will remember that as a sovereign, he or she has the ability to do what is right. Unfortunately, how many of us can say that I am doing what is right? So I am led that to my, to that my lecture and I agree with you, sir, that we all have individual responsibilities to ourselves and to our nation. Now, to Professor Rutimi, I did a Ajayi, sorry, Professor Rutimi Ajayi. Yes, the four P's are very relevant in terms of uh, the matters of policy issues. Our major productivity, that's the geography of it. When you mention potency, it has to do with the, uh, the effectiveness of the policy itself. Does it have what it takes to address the issues? And that speaks to the issue of capability. I didn't have enough time to talk of capability. And it's because of the issue of capability that lives in the first place was set up. Are we capable of setting up policies that will work? for our people. In the universities, today I mentioned to advise myself that needs will get off its high horse and begin to relate with the universities. That is another to ensure that we solve this problem that has to do with potency. So the four P's are very relevant, sir. However, I just did not even want to bring this to theoretical and as I did mention it was all embedded in it. Now you spoke to the matter of power. Beyond power, my own general belief is that if 
the policies by themselves are packed up with the right strategy. And if they have been well thought out, the power that will run it will just be will be commensurate with, I mean, they, they, that, that would not be a problem in itself. Because what is good is generally well absorbed and you don't need too much power to make it work. If you look at the issue of uh, rebadu, running the EFCC at the point in time, if we are today the national security advisor, there was no power they gave you, different from the power that they gave to Lamude, different from the power that they gave to the woman that left after that took over, after Lamude, they all, they all had the same power. It is about the capability of the runner, I use the word runner, and their own personal agenda. I spoke about agenda. I said, Individuals are different, and the way they want to run things may also be different. So no matter what you power you give any vice chancellor, if he does not know how to use it, or does not want to use it, or is lazy and cannot use it, then nothing will happen. That is why I said you should clap for your vice chancellor because he knows his powers and is using it in a humble way. You don't see him that we are carrying himself as the vice chancellor all over the place. He has adopted strategy in unity as a strategy. So, for everything, the power is always there. And I agree with you, bro, that that, that that must always be the will to implement policies. The will evolves at the end of the day from that individual at the end of the day. What and what is the individual able to do? What does he know how to do? Is it the right person to implement the policy? So, so to a lot of I agree to that uh, the will must also be there. Now, the question of the I would love that um, you, you, you partner with names, and I'm sure your friend is there, Professor, uh, you know, you know, this is your vertical and uh, horizontal communications. Now that our NIPS have occupied several offices in the past, and you wish that we build a uh, bottom-up approach, but that's what you are saying in terms of radical communications, in developing policies. But I must always tell you, sir, that, and we do respect, the generality of people at the grassroots do not have the education, the understanding, and the focus to effectively participate in your theoretical medical communication. I call it theoretical medical communication because I've seen that unless, of course, at the middle level or at the top level, you have a leader like your vice chancellor that can take ideas to the grassroots. It is difficult to generate such ideas from that particular grassroots. So it is something that we can still keep looking at. How can we ensure that policies are developed from the bottom? Utilitarianism does not mean that we forget the grassroots. But we should always rather be frank with you. If you go to the grassroots and you need to ask them to participate, we realize that in the university that people will plan for don't even know what we are planning for them. But the reality is that at the grassroots, because of structural defects in our system, they don't even know what they want. So it's left for us who are somehow have been able to climb that ladder, ladder and have become an elite. Everybody here is an elite. All of the, the students we have here, sorry students, I like to call you children so that I can always have more control. They all, all of you are elites. And you must use the power of being an elite to influence what they think at the grassroots. You have to participate at the grassroots and become part of it. I told someone, I said, 
our educational system is where it is. Because even our students here, immediately they become undergraduates. They need to have a religious belief. How many of them will want to come now? They believe that farming is for the old, uneducated, and one crumpled human being in the village. And they wear a new toga. So if things are going to change, it comes back to the individual that will understand our society and try to find a way. I don't know that way, Professor Bilei. How can we ensure this vertical competition goes beyond mere mentioning it? And we build the trust from the grassroots. I mentioned that when I went to Sokoto, in spite of the beautiful schools, where the two schools have seen, the chicken child is not coming. Do we not say that they do not communicate with those people before they build the school? So we have to look for the external reasons why some things are happening. That's why I said, from what I can gather, they do not trust the English language. And since English language is not the only medium of teaching, what is wrong with Nigerian universities teaching in Arabic? If that would make more people come to school in certain parts of Nigeria, after all, knowledge does not have a language. So when you go back to your issue of medical communication, look again at the language of knowledge. The language of knowledge is not English. And of course, remember, for those of us who have a whole lot of philosophy here, we remember uh, I I I I have seen that from the from the Arabia area. He didn't speak English. He didn't back to that, he didn't speak English. But they spoke Arabic and they brought up knowledge. So Nigeria as a country must look at whether we want to continue to communicate English as the only language of knowledge seeking. Why can't we let those who want to learn in Arabic learn their science in Arabic? If it will bring a better understanding, I don't know if some of us who are old enough to remember the experiment at the University of Ife, where you are trying to actually teach science in Yoruba. I don't know what happened to that ex experiment. But if that experiment has worked, nothing is wrong in teaching people teach science in Hausa if that is how we bring the children to school. So the vertical communication thing was taken to its uh, the language component. Not only do you want to communicate with them, the language component is important. Don't let us free ourselves from the hegemony of English as the only source of instruction that is acceptable in our schools. Until we do that, there will be a lot of policy services. Sir, you also mentioned the matter of political parties and uh, the ideologies. I don't need to say this, sir. There are no ideological political parties in Nigeria. PDP, DPC, all are election platforms. They don't have ideologies. The first shot I got in my life was in 1990. I went to the hospital won the election without any known ideology. I do not believe that people vote on the basis of ideology. Obama did not offer any ideology. Go and check. He didn't even have any cardinal points. And since then, our policies, our political party, everything changed. Everybody moves from one party to the other. All we look for are election platform. So we can no longer talk about it. Ideologies, and that of course speaks to your issue of government changing. Now, when I said, let us make our policies into law, what I'm referring to is that there are some overarching frames for development within which we can subsume our goals and aspirations. I'm saying that let us make those ones into laws so that no matter what. I know they don't have ideologies. No matter what government comes into place, no matter what individual differences we have, those overarching developmental agenda will have become law. So if you come with your craziness, let's assume, 
nothing will happen to those objectives. If for example we say we want to build 25,000 kilometers of railway and it becomes a law, and we say every four years every governor must build a certain percentage of that 25,000, if it is a law, he or she will be bound to follow the law. So, if we identify national priorities and we subsume, and we all agree and subsume our individual um, ethos to that, to those national challenges, and they become national priorities, and we can split them into laws, then we give a time period when we want the law to work. There's something that says the law must work from the must work for 100 years. There are some laws that could be enacted for a short period. So when we make such policies laws, then we can be sure that the summer source we speak about will be a thing of the past. Yes, generally people see summer source as negative because if, when they label summer source is negative. But when we are doing our acrobatics and we summer source, is that a negative? When you succeed in me or six summer songs, they clap for you because you have done something right. So I said, do not see summer songs as being necessarily negative. There are times, <laughs> yes, there are times when we have the need for them. If I'm going to keep advocating that we should, as a policy in Nigeria, Break the hegemony of the English language as the instruction, as the medium of, uh, as the sole language of instruction. We should, so that more and more people keep complaining and we are doing the same thing the same way. We say, well, our school children are many in the north. We don't find the reason. The reason for me is that they don't trust the English language. Now, if you take them in Arabic or Hausa, and that's what they trust. Knowledge is knowledge, no matter what language in which you are, you are taking it. So, do we now say that the government one day decides to say the language of instruction can also be Hausa or can also, so also be Yoruba? Do we say that is a positive somersault or a negative somersault? For me, that is a policy, positive somersault. If you believe in it, and if it happens. So let me stop at that. And for the kind permission of the Vice Chancellor, I will take three more questions so that um, we'll wrap this session up because um, we'll still go to treat our uh, guest lecturer um, to lunch before he travels back to the Abuja. I would like to call on the Professor Tai Oluan um, of the Faculty of Agriculture, Prince of Wakarabu University, Aiba, who is here with us on a visit. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The guest speaker, the vice principal, and the people at the hunting room, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have listened to the guest speaker. And uh, I just want to take on one issue, that issue of corruption that he said is one of the reasons for this um, policy so much sort. Uh, but I, I have noticed that when we talk of corruption, people think of this material um, accumulation, the wrong way, and we leave out the mental aspect. Now, the individual who alleged that uh, the government, some of the governors are more corrupt than himself. He was looking at it from the material point of view. But then if you look at it from the mental point of view, you will find out that most of our leaders lack mental alacrity. <laughs> Yesterday, <laughs> yes, I was talking with somebody. And then, it's just, this is democracy. I wish we could have a system that accommodate some radical uh, intervention. For instance, why not we consider a situation whereby all those who have ruled at the level of the presidency or governor since uh, independence today, who are still alive, 
that we should consign them to jail so that those of them who are there now will know that if, if they fail from demonstrating the mental accuracy that will move this country forward in the next four years, they will also join them in jail. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me let me piano the microphone to Professor El Bishak M O N. El Bishak. Yes. No, you. You are here. Yes. You forgotten? <laughs> he is um, of the Federal University Latvia. Yes. Who so? I see how smart. Professor. I think there is a name in the picture. So much. That's why. I put up a hand, but it was a different name that was called. <laughs> I am Professor Meiji Al Azmok. No. Those are my names. Right. Yes. Uh, the guest speaker, sir, let me join my colleagues in congratulating you for a brilliant presentation. <laughs> it also impressed me more when you took those eight issues. As comments, the way you address them, I'm very, very impressed. But, sir, I want to ask this quick question. When you had a meeting with President Mohammed, and he told you that the governors were more powerful than him, was he speaking with regards to policy or was he speaking with regards to other issues? And what was your view for him telling you that the governors? I'm more important than you. You as a person. <laughs> What's your name? Is he correct? You feel he's correct? And the second one, sir, I want to speak as somebody from Faculty of Education. Faculty of Education is the mother and father of all of our faculties. And all the children in the university belong to Faculty of Education. <laughs> sir, you have raised when you were introducing your lecture and you sent students to write down something down that in the next very short time, medicine will come through the phone. I have a daughter who is studying medicine. There are medical students sitting here. I know there's tension in them. What is the fate of what they are studying? Based on what you have stated. <laughs> How can you tell that tension in the students? Please, your opinion on that. Maybe I have an education for the set of students who are my students. Finally, finally, Professor Shola Adeyaji, MLA. Yes, and so the guest speaker, let me start on this simple. Uh, mine is just a little contribution. And uh, maybe I, I was listening to Professor Ibley, my very good friend, and uh, my brother, uh, on, the, on the issue of policy communication. And it's, it's an area that has been of concern to us at the National Institute, which we have taken up for a very long time. Uh, because you discover that there are good policies that are not resonated well with people which have to lead to some aspect. I'll give you an example. When you remember the policy, an agricultural policy they call uh, Ruga. I don't know whether you remember. Uh, when, when you look at the contents of that policy, it's one of those good policies that have come around the fortunes of this country. But it was poorly communicated. And because of that, he died in natural death. And today we are no longer talking of food, and they have given it all sorts of names. Uh, I think the problem is that many people at the corridors of power don't understand the power of communication. And that is what we need to impress on policy makers, which we have been doing actually. And then uh, let me just give uh, an example of 
when you have inconsistency in your policy, how it can actually affect your development. We, we, we met with some business groups from Poland. We, we actually went there. And they were saying, oh, we are from Nigeria, very big country, uh, cheap labor, uh, large market. The dream of any investor. But they wanted to come and invest in Nigeria and they decided not to come after their feasibility studies. What was wrong? Now, in an automobile industry, when you invest, the first five years, you are not expecting any, any profit. You, are, you continue to reinvest. Until maybe six years, you start breaking even, and then before you start making profit. But they were not sure that they have a 10 years plan. The policy they have used to plan for 10 years will be there for 10 years. And because of that, if you like, you can go all over the world to look for FDI, foreign uh, direct investment. Business people are not going to count if they are not convinced that your policies will be consistent and they can plan with it. So, the president can jump get around the world, it will lead to any serious investment. So, this is just one example of how policy inconsistency can actually affect whatever plan you are uh, making. And the last one I would like to speak on is what the uh, director general said about overarching policies becoming law. If you remember this country during the NPN and UPN period, they were talking about housing and they were doing low cost houses here and there. You can imagine if we had continued with the housing policies of that time up to today, housing wouldn't have been a major problem again. But then the regime came, jettisoned it, and that was the end. So I think this, uh, I just want to make this a uh, brief comment. Just so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me start with the question one day on the matter of mental corruption. Sometimes when you look at the way and manner that some public office holders steal from the public uh, treasury, you subscribe to the idea that uh, some people require that we check their brains. Now, a person is 16 years old. There is no human being that can eat a whole cow in a year. I don't know if there is a human being now, eat a whole cow in the air. <laughs> 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 Contradictions. 
We are products, Nigerians are products of what I call for, uh, of concluded ideological investments. When we were growing up, we didn't know we were being bombarded with all sorts. Some of our professors wanted us to be capitalists. Some wanted us to be socialists. And of course, we were caught in between the balance hands of, the, of those times, the only model of those times, and of course, and where are they and the rest of them who felt capitalism was it. So, in the majority of our own generation, grew up confused as to what ideology should run our country. And of course, sir, I agree with you, capitalism comes the, the, the avarice, the tendency to want to acquire everything. Because uh, there's only capitalism speaks to that accumulation and accumulation and accumulation of wealth. And we know some of those of us who are parents today are confused as well as those who socialistic in our thinking or capitalistic in our thinking. And capitalism, who wins is who has, who has more. So, we have children who have also learned from us. If a parent has 10 cars, why would the child or daughter not want to have two iPhones? Because these are things we teach them. So, a lot of issues with our mental states concerning corruption. And because we want to corrupt the system, we try to change policies that do not work for us. That was why I mentioned it. So it's a potent factor. We have to look at corruption in our DNA. I was expecting Prof to mention a particular aspect of corruption. That is not only material accumulation that is corruption. But when you are a professor, and I'm sorry to say this, and you want students to do what they are not supposed to do, or you are pushing them towards doing what is not, because you have the power, it is also a form of corruption. <laughs> when you are a pastor, when you are a pastor, and all you preach is what suits you. I'm sorry to say, I know that some pastors are here, and we do respect to those who are in the clergy. When it comes to pay tithes, when they are studying the Bible, everything they talk about is what the Old Testament says about people paying tithes. <laughs> when it pays them, they talk about what the New Testament says about people not doing this, not doing that. I said, I said, sociologically, we are selective in what we do. We were policies are supposed to conform to the principles of utilitarianism, where you do not think for yourself only, but for the vast majority of people in society. So please do not look at corruption as somebody who only steals money. Also look at our social life, our political life, and try to play our own role. We are not, I'm not a saint, but every day, as long as we are like, what did Socrates say? I don't know if there's a philosopher, uh, any of us who is a philosopher here. Yeah. He said, no man could do what? Be knowledgeable unless he first realizes what? Ignorance. If you are not, if you are still ignorant of the fact that every leader's corrupt tendencies, our nation will not change. Now, I come to Professor Jimmy Alpha's Mark. He spoke about my personal encounter with him. Right? And uh, we had a chance with a representing the army that was here next to me. And as the boss was going on, he was convinced by our findings and said, DG, I'm going to tell you one story. So he told me the story, and I said, I'm saying, please do not say this in the public. But he said, no, now that you said, I should not say, I'm saying it. <laughs> he said, do you know that governors will ask local government chairman 
to sign for 100 million. And once they have signed, they will say, you will receive the money tomorrow. And they will only receive 15 million. And the local government chairman cannot say anything. He said, can we tell any government to sign that he has received 2 billion as his state ambition and then send him 1 billion without the government going anywhere? So he said, they have so much power over local government officials that they use their money for their own purpose. Meanwhile, as Mr. President, the project is not in his hands. He cannot spend what the National Assembly did not appropriate. And of course, don't forget National Assemblies have oversight functions. The President of Nigeria, I tell you, cannot steal money. He cannot. Without, because you need to know this thing. If you steal money, it will be shown. Because monies are made for certain places. And once the money gets there, how can you, the President, go and say that bring money? It doesn't work that way. I assure you, no president will be to steal money. He can only use his position to benefit others and not himself. Because after all, the president wanted to do what he wanted to do. The Yoruba sound is saying, he said, Uwa, Uwolo, Obade, Ijinono. If you make that money, what are you going to use the money for? I can always assure you, President Roland Abedin, who is our president today, has no reason at all to steal our money. Because there's nothing that he's contesting for. It is a governor that wants a second term or wants to propagate himself as the leader of a particular section of the country that probably will steal money or wants to benefit somebody. So I was convinced by this uh, conversation. Personally convinced that governors can easily steal money than Mr. President. Mr. President does not have a venue, I assure you, of stealing money from the federal account. Have you heard that anybody said the general has stolen money? He can only use his position. And I'm sure the very president cannot steal money. It is governors that have the power to do as they like in their states. And I'll just remind us, two years ago, or was it last year, there was supposed to be a concern in the we are chairman of the government to give autonomy to spend their own money. Do you know that as we speak, or before going there, only 16 states have signed up to autonomy. But everybody shout that local government should be autonomous. How come the out of that? States, only 16 states have signed on the autonomy of the government. So, sir, I go back to you, sir. It's a matter of mental corruption. Not that we don't know what it is. Now, to the fact of the importance of our culture of education, I have the last semester, even before the school, if the university has a faculty of education. And I mentioned yes. To be kindly, faculties of education, I do not want to say they are compulsory everywhere as a faculty. But the elements of what is taught in faculties of education should actually be in the standard curriculum for anyone that ever gets the opportunity to attend the university. Because when you talk of radical communication, it is the understanding that you have from the philosophy, sociology, of education that will enable people to understand how to communicate at the grassroots. But here, once somebody is in the faculty of social sciences, he feels superior to somebody in the faculty of education, forgetting that all forms of knowledge are important for all of us. So I agree with you, the purposes of education are very important. In the issues of communication, they are very important. And of course, everything we do requires that we always educate ourselves. Nigeria is where it is because 
as adults. We don't even know how to teach adults. And new knowledge is come into the fray. New forms of education come into the fray. But how many of us have the understanding of how to teach adults? We look at the balance of adult education as what are they doing? Forgetting that learning is a lifelong experience. Am I correct, sir? We continue to learn, and you must learn, learn how to teach adults. All of us here, we only know how to teach children. Now that I'm an old man, I need education of some form. Who will teach me? If you don't have experts in adult education. Because we all learn in different ways. And adult is so difficult to teach. Because the eyes, if the eyes, if we have the mechanism of recording all that our individual eyes have seen, you will see that you will see the reason why two eyes, two different eyes, cannot look at the same problem and see the same thing. The things the eyes have seen are different from the things my eyes have seen. And when we are confronted with a common problem, his response will be done by what the things his eyes have seen. And my the things my eyes have seen. Two different adults who all their lives have seen different things. It is the adult education expert that knows how to teach people whose eyes have seen so much. It's easy to teach, to teach our young ones. Because after all, how many things as their eyes seen? Let me stop with that. I want to recognize um, Major A.M. Izan, representing Commander 12 Brigade. I would also want to recognize in a special way um, on the outrage of the DG, Professor Shola Adeyaju, and my head of the Affairs Department. I would also like to recognize uh, um, two more journalists that are here by Goibo Salihu that was from the print. Thank you very much. Um, the Vice Chancellor, sir, I would like to invite you to present the token of Somalia and appreciation from our distinguished lecturer for this lecture. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
adopt the already established protocol. So our guest lecturer, sir, Professor Ayo Omotayo, the Director General of NIS. We are very glad to have you here. We appreciate you, sir. Your lecture, your insightful discourse has really benefited our academic community. It has further deepened our knowledge in the areas of policy and strategic studies, sir. We appreciate you, sir. We thank you for your dedication to knowledge and your commitment to excellence, sir. Sir, these qualities align with the core values of our university, and we really appreciate you. And we also thank you for the opportunity for collaboration which you have opened for us here at Federal University of And we are assuring you, sir, that the university has been led by our Vice Chancellor, Professor Olaya Miyake, who will not take this for granted. That's right. We appreciate you very much, sir. And to all our invited guests, we thank you very much. All our deans, directors, professors, heads of department, staff, and students of this university. Thank you for your robust participation. You have all made this event a successful one. Once again, sir, we thank you very much and we wish you a safe journey back to your destination. Thank you very much. Thank you. After this ceremony, the Vice Chancellor would wish that our DG accompany him to his um, office. And have a 10 to 15 minutes lunch. The DJ sir. Shall we all rise for the national anthem? The national anthem.
gente 